Good morning, Hillside. Great to have you with us as we get going this morning. Let's stand as we sing our opening hymns.
and welcome some of the people who are gathered around you as we get started. It's great to have you all here. Please go ahead and be seated. A couple announcements as we get started. One is that um, it's great to have you here or uh, online. If you are joining us online, thanks for being there too. This Wednesday, we are having a funeral service. Uh, our friend Irma Peter passed away. Some of you would remember Irma, uh, a sweet lady, uh, 93, and is now at heaven, in heaven with her Lord. And so we celebrate that. Uh, this Wednesday, the service is at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Uh, the other announcement is that we, this morning, for kids 10 and under, have a puzzle that will happen during uh, the sermon. And so you need to uh, watch for letters that will pop up on the screen during the sermon slides. Write them down or remember them and tell me at the end of the service what it, the puzzle spelt. It's a word puzzle. It's not Wordle, okay, adults, parents, relax. It's not Wordle, uh, but it is super great. Uh, so uh, kids 10 and under, uh, keep track of the letters on the screen, and there's a chance for you to win a prize. Let's pray as we get started. God, as we gather together this morning, we ask that you would settle us you would settle our hearts and minds, that you would just help us to tune out everything that's going on in the world outside, everything we've watched in the news, all the um, chaos and disruption and fear and worry, all the highlights, all the celebrations, all the busyness, all the... We pray that you'd help us to shut out all the debates and the protests and the honking, and you'd help us to shut out all the division, and that we would gather here with this group of people gathered around us or gather at home in our living rooms knowing that the reason we're here is you, that the reason we're here is your son, Jesus. And so I pray, God, that that would just surpass every other possible division that might exist in our minds and that that would be the key, the foundation, the most significant thing, not only in our lives, but in how we view other people, how we interact with them, how we interact with the world around us, how we approach every situation. So Lord, as you settle us, we ask that you would help us, uh, that you would drive out the sin that's in our lives, you'd expose it to us, that by your Holy Spirit we'd be able to turn away from it, that we'd repent and receive your grace in Jesus, and that we'd be able to walk uh, from this point forward, that we'd be able to move forward following you, trusting in you, loving you, receiving kindness and grace from you, and then just extending that to a world so deeply in need of healing and forgiveness and grace. We pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change One thing remains One thing remains
Questioning Christianity. That's our series. That's the series we've been in for the last month or so, and where we're hopping back in this morning. Uh, kids, again, there's a, a secret puzzle, a word puzzle up on the screen as we go through the slides, and you have a chance to win big. So uh, talk to me at the end of the service if you get it. For hundreds of years, even thousands of years, the biggest challenge uh, against theism, against believing in God, has been this. If God is so good, why is there evil? If God's so good, why is there evil? If there's this all-powerful, all-good, all-knowing God, why does he allow evil to exist? And it's not just a question people out there have. It's a question all of us have encountered at some point. God, why have you allowed this to happen? We'll just do a quick poll If this is true for you, just sit in your seats looking blankly at me. Have you ever confronted the problem of evil? Yes. Of course, we all have. It rattles all of us, shakes all of us. It's one of the biggest reasons people don't believe in God or one of the biggest reasons uh, people walk away from God. God, I trusted in you. I believed in you. I was following you, and you let this happen to me. This morning we're going to talk about that problem, the problem of evil, and we'll talk about it uh, philosophically, and we'll talk about it theologically, and we'll end with the most important part, we'll talk about it personally. Because it's one idea to have an abstract understanding or thought or explanation to say, oh yeah, logically I understand how this could happen. Or it's, uh, it's possible to look at the Bible and say, yes, I get how I see this unfold in the Bible, but it's very different to confront a tragedy in your own life and say, Yes, God, I still trust you. Yes, God, I still believe in you. Even though this war is raging, uh, even though my marriage is crumbling, even though this diagnosis is incurable, even though this pandemic goes on, even though all these other things, I will continue to believe in you. And so that's where we'll start this morning, the question of evil. Philosophers have approached this lots of different ways, and kind of a common argument against God is one that's up on the screen. It says this, God's power means that God can prevent any evil, since God can do absolutely everything. God's goodness means he would prevent any evil. He's good, so if he has power to stop it, he should stop it. But there's evil. Therefore, atheist philosophers announce there is no God. And the logic there makes sense. If he's all-powerful, if he can do anything, and if he knows everything, he sees the evil unfolding, and if he's all good, then why doesn't in his knowledge and his goodness he use his power to stop evil? And so people look at that and say, that's it. There cannot be a good, all-knowing, all-powerful God since evil continues to exist. Before we explore that more about the problem of evil facing Christians, I just want to point out the problem of evil exists for every single worldview. It doesn't, it's not just a problem for Christians, it's a problem for uh, Buddhists and for Hindus and for atheists and, and for everybody. All of us somehow have to rationalize why does evil exist for us? If you remember the worldviews we looked at, if you're a pantheist, if you're someone like a Hindu or a Buddhist, if you fall into that camp of Sikhism, they still have the same problem. Why does God allow evil to exist? Or why is there evil? And their answer is this. Evil doesn't exist. It's an illusion. It's a false perception. You're seeing things incorrectly. So let's imagine just for a minute that you are at home with your family and you are about to sit down to a great dinner. You've got a bucket of KFC chicken. You've got the fries and the gravy. Your dog's sitting right there and you're feeding them some fries. And it's just a perfect night. And all of a sudden, somebody crashes a jumbo jet into your house, flattens your family, ruins the KFC, even your dog's wiped out. And you're just sitting there and you say, why would this happen? And a Hindu would respond to you and say, this is an illusion. This evil, this suffering is a wrong perception. And the problem isn't that this has happened. The problem is actually internal. The problem is your desire and your craving. Remember, that's the root cause of all evil. And so the goal of Hinduism, Buddhism, is to be freed from your cravings, your desires. So they say what's actually wrong here is you desired your family to live. You wanted to have another piece of chicken. And now that's ruined. And so you need to be set free from your cravings, and that will remove the suffering. 
For an atheist, they can't offer you a, a lot better either because if you're an atheist, if you are, are a naturalist, evil can't exist. Why? Because the presence of evil would demand that there's an objective truth. And they don't believe that that exists. We just evolved. We're here just naturally by coincidence and fluke. And so to say that there's an objective truth doesn't fit in with their worldview. So they'd have to say, well, you're upset because we've agreed, all of us have agreed, crashing jumbo jets into a house is not uh, nice to do. It's not objectively evil or wrong. We just have agreed you shouldn't do it. And so they'd say to you as a word of comfort, uh, a Hindu might say, well, be comforted knowing this. If you have good karma, next time in your life, this may not happen to you. Are you relieved? No, not really. An atheist would say to you, well, the good news is uh, they died instantly on impact and they'll never suffer again because they are dead forever. Are you comforted? No. And so there's a problem. The problem of evil exists regardless of your world view. In fact, I think Christianity addresses the problem of evil better than any other world view at all. And so we're going to work our way through that. And we're going to do that through a framework of creation, fall, redemption. We're going to follow those three steps, creation, fall, redemption. People have asked, if God is all-powerful, couldn't he create a universe where evil doesn't exist? And the answer is, he did. Yes, and he did. If we look at the beginning of the Bible, as God creates everything, the resounding echo day after day is, and it was good. Not just good, but perfect. It was absolutely whole and unified and at peace within itself. The Bible says this, and God saw everything he made, and behold, it was very good. That's significant for lots of reasons. One, it tells us that God is creator. He's the one who made it all. It tells us he made it with intention and on purpose. We didn't just arise out of uh, goo from a coincidence. And it tells us that oh, we've been made in the image of God, which means we, we have a knowledge of uh, intrinsically uh, right and wrong uh, because God does, and so he's imparted that into us as well. So what happened? If at creation everything was good and perfect, what happened? That's step two, the fall. Look at Genesis 2 with me. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the days that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Spoiler alert, they eat of it. Did you guys know that? You've read that part already? Okay, so they eat. It's interesting, at the beginning, at the point of creation, the road to eternity is vastly wide, and the road to destruction and death is so, so narrow. You can eat of any tree at all, except this one. Everything was good. Everything was perfect. And from that point, the point that they eat from that forbidden fruit Everything has unraveled. Everything is now less than perfect. And the reality of evil exists in our world. Something I appreciate about the Christian worldview is it doesn't say, oh, evil's not doesn't exist. You're just thinking about it wrong. Uh, that's not a real thing. The Bible says, oh, yeah. Starting on, on chapter 3, page 3 of the Bible, evil's real. It's right there, and it impacts absolutely everything. As I look at the world around me, I'd say, yeah. I see it. Everything is impacted by the reality of evil. So why? Why does God create us with this possibility to turn away from him? It's called the free will argument. That's how philosophers talk about it. The free will argument that we were created with free will and basically God gave us the ability to uh, love him or reject him. Well, why would God do that? Uh, we've talked about this before, but imagine you went down to Toys R Us and you bought a teddy bear, and whenever you poke the teddy bear in the tummy, it says, I love you. Does it really love you? I love you. I love you. You could rip off its ear. I love you. You know, hold it under a tub of water. You could kick it across the sports field. I love you. Does it love you? No. Try that with someone in your family. Poke them in the belly. See what they say. It won't always be I love you, I don't think. 
Why? Because they have free will. They have the, the ability to respond however they might choose. We have that innately built into us uh, because that's how God designed us and made us. C.S. Lewis wrote this. He, he writes, Why then did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. A word of automata, of creatures that worked like machines, would hardly be worth having. The happiness which God designs for his higher creatures is the happiness of being freely, voluntarily united to him and to each other. And for that they must be free. Of course, God knew what would happen if they used their freedom the wrong way. Apparently, he thought it was worth the risk. It's a, a fascinating perspective. Well, if he didn't give us the ability to reject him, then we're just automated machines. <laughs> I love you! And so he doesn't want that. Instead, he creates us with the ability to experience love, joy, uh, all of those things which are only possible, C.S. Lewis suggests, if you have the ability not to do them. A brilliant philosopher, uh, maybe one of the most brilliant Christian philosophers and apologists is a man by the name of Alvin Plantinga. And he, uh, in response to that debate, that argument, well, God must not exist, he instead writes out this formula. And it says this. It says, uh, one, an omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent God created the world. So it's an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God created the world. God created a good world in which evil was possible and became actual and had a good reason for doing so. Therefore, the world contains evil. I don't know if any of you like philosophy. Uh, I normally find it very abstract, but these are very significant statements because they help shape how people view the world. And, and so uh, atheist philosophers have said, no, for these reasons, since evil exists and God is all-powerful and all-good, then he can't exist. Ellen Plantinga uh, wrote this uh, not all that long ago, really, and um, the response from the atheist world is uh, significant, from atheist philosophers. One of the most prominent atheist philosophers, uh, I think he died in 1983, uh, was a guy, J.L. Mackey. And his response to this formula is to say this, since this defense is formally, that is logically possible, and its principles involve no real abandonment of our ordinary view of the opposition between good and evil, we can concede that the problem of evil does not, after all, show that the central doctrines of theism are logically inconsistent with another. This is one of the smartest atheists uh, on the planet at the time, and he looks at this formula and says, you got me, you're right. A good God and the reality of evil can coexist at the same time. You and I are like, yeah, we knew that already. But for them, for, for that camp, for a naturalistic, atheistic, worldview philosophy group to say that is super, super significant. People sometimes ask, why doesn't God just stop evil from happening? We've talked about this before too, but just imagine that I've gotten really angry with Jim. Jim talks to me sometimes after church, and let's say he gets me really angry, and I decide I'm going to kick him right in the butt as he goes. At what point would God stop that evil from happening? Is it right before my foot hits his butt? Like I'm standing here like this and he's just looking at me? Is it before I can wind up? Is it before I decide I'm going to kick him? Is it before I get angry? Is it before Jim says the thing that was so upsetting to me? At what point does God have to roll back all of our thoughts and responses before we're suddenly just not free at all anymore? At what point do we become those automated machines that C.S. Lewis was talking about? How far does God have to roll back the reality of sin before he's just controlling us every moment, every day? Here's another reason that God allows some suffering. Some degree of suffering and pain is actually good for us. Imagine one day you're not feeling very well. A, a pain in your stomach and you go to the hospital and they say oh my goodness your appendix is burst you need surgery right now they do surgery and you're saved but imagine if you didn't feel that pain your appendix bursts you know you go out you're having a nice time and then boom, you just keel over dead some amount of suffering actually warns us hey something is wrong here there is a problem here that needs to be addressed uh, we experience that often 
in our lives. Hold on, something's not right. And then we sort of, that, that there's a problem that needs to be remedied or fixed. We could take that uh, even further and say that sometimes the events that are painful or evil, God actually rewrites to make them good. Just thinking about the Bible, we see that really clearly in a story like the story of Joseph. Remember Joseph, he's got his uh, brothers, ten brothers, and um, they are upset with him. And so upset that they sell him into slavery, he makes his way off to Egypt, but then things reverse and he rises to prominence. And he actually ends up saving all sorts of people, including those same brothers who sold him into slavery. He, he kind of concludes that whole journey with this. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Sometimes suffering can actually work out for good. We don't like it. We don't like that period of suffering, but we sure do appreciate the good outcome that comes. Oh my goodness, I almost died. Uh, I almost died because uh, my appendix burst, but then they saved me, and whew, now I appreciate life more, and you know, I'm just living life to the fullest. Sometimes pain and suffering can be good for us. And I think that's easier to see in small situations, like a burst appendix, but it's harder to see when you look at a world and say, man, why... Why did 5 million people die during this pandemic? Or why are there wars going on all the time? I mean, right now we're hearing about Ukraine and Russia and the threat of war, but there's wars actually happening right now uh, in the world in places like Haiti and Yemen and Ethiopia. I mean, other places there are these wars going on. Why, why do drug cartels continue to exist? Why have thousands of people killed themselves in BC over the last year with drug overdoses? I mean, there's all these questions where we could look at and say, sure, an appendix is one thing, but these large-scale things, why does God allow them to happen? Philosophers respond to that saying that God may have sufficient moral reason to allow it. Here's a small-scale example. I remember when Summer was very little, less than a year old probably, and she had to go get her shots. Remember that, parents taking your baby for some shots? And so we're there, and we're in the uh, Fraser Health office, and Summer's having a great time. This doctor's great. She's blowing bubbles, and Summer's sitting on my lap. And then the doctor's like, grab Summer's arm. So I'm like, okay, I'm holding her arms. And Summer's having a great time. And then this needle comes, and Summer does this. (laughs) And she looks at me. Like, how could you let that happen, Dad? Why would you let that happen? And she was just, just like less than a year old, and I did not have a way to communicate to her, this is actually for your good. This is actually so that you never have to worry about polio ever again for the rest of your life. And so I felt like I had sufficient moral reason to inflict that moment of pain on her, even though she didn't comprehend it, and even though... I didn't enjoy it. It's not like I was like, oh yeah, let's do that. You got any more shots we can give her? Let's just really get her right now. No, I I mean, it was uh, upsetting for me and for her, but there was no way to kind of communicate. There's sufficient moral reason to allow this to happen. We see that kind of unfold in, in a way in the book of Job. You remember the story of Job? Uh, Job just has everything going for him, and then it's suddenly all taken away. And his friends come to him, and they're like, just curse God and be done with this. And as this conversation goes along, eventually God responds in chapter 38, saying this, Where were you when I laid the foundation, the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand, who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. You stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set, or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. God's saying to Job, you don't see the whole picture here. Where were you? On what authority do you have to kind of contradict me and complain against me? I'm the one who's laid the foundations of everything, and perhaps, Job, I have a fuller, better picture and understanding of what's happening right now that maybe God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are greater than our ways and that's hard for us to swallow at times but it remains true if you believe in this all-knowing God then you also have to agree that man I just maybe don't always get or understand what he's doing and why 
That same philosopher, Alvin Plantinga, described it this way. We have uh, some campers in here. Who, who likes to camp? Put up your hand if you're a camper. Okay, we have some campers. Some of you are glampers, and you raised your hand, and which is fine. We'll let that slide. But the picture that you're camping in a tent, okay? You've got a tent, and Alvin Plantinga said it's a bit like this. Imagine you've got your little dome tent set up, and I said to you, peek inside and tell me, uh, are there any St. Bernards in the tent? So you're like, okay, so you unzip the tent, you look, and you're like, no, no St. Bernards. And I could ask you, are you 100% sure? Yeah, there are no St. Bernards in the tent. And then he said, but what if I asked you, are there any no seams in the tent? You know no seams, campers? Those little, you can't even see them. They're just little tiny flies. He said, what if I asked you, look in the tent, tell me, are there any no seams in there? So you open the tent and you look and you're like, well, I don't see any. But Elvin Plantinga says, just because you can't see them doesn't mean they don't exist. And just because you don't understand the reason God might have for allowing something to happen doesn't mean the reason doesn't exist. It just means that you're unable to see it, comprehend it, understand it right now. But God has sufficient moral reason for it. One category of evil is called natural evil. That would be things like uh, tsunamis, hurricanes, earthquakes, flooding, uh, heat domes, uh, atmospheric rivers, right? We're learning some of these phrases are becoming closer to us. What about those types of things? Why do those happen? Because uh, evil that people commit against themselves makes sense to us, right? We're like, oh yeah, well, that person is responsible. That person did it. But what about when all of creation seems to turn against us? And they would point us, Christian uh, apologists would point us to Genesis 3. It says this, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. Cursed is the ground. You want one thing, but it's going to grow another thing. All of creation actually is suffering the consequences of the fall. And it has turned against you. It's uncontrollable. I, I wanted, who here gardens? Has your garden ever gone awry on you? Has nature ever turned against you? Have you ever been fighting off varmin and rats and whatever else to stay out of your garden? Those, I grew those tomatoes for myself, not you. Yeah, of course. Why? Because all creation is undergoing the pains of the fall. And we all suffer because of it. Eleanor Stump is a brilliant philosopher. She had this to say about natural evil. Natural evil, the pain of disease, the intermittent and unpredictable destruction of natural disasters, the decay of old age, the imminence of death, takes away a person's satisfaction with himself. It tends to humble him, show him his frailty, make him reflect on the transience of temporal goods, and turn his attention towards otherworldly things away from the things of this world. No amount of moral or natural evil, of course, can guarantee that a man will place his faith in God. But evil of this sort is the best hope, I think, and maybe the only effective means for bringing men to such a state. This brilliant woman says, man, I, I don't know, I can't explain all of natural evil, but I do know that it's in those moments of great conflict, great crisis, where, there's, where you have no control over it at all, where people are most likely to cry out and say, God, help me. Man, a tsunami's coming, a uh, uh, hurricane's coming, all the earth is shifting, and I have, I have no hope left. I have no chance left. There's nothing I can do to prevent this. God, would you help me? All that brings us um, is the fall. The fall is a result of all those places, circumstances, situations of evil. So we've talked about creation. We've talked about fall. Let's talk about that last category, the category of redemption. Redemption says that God has not abandoned us to evil. Uh, redemption says that God looks at us and still sees value and still has hope. And so he does something about it. In Romans, Paul writes this, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. I like that Paul doesn't say, everything's great, there is no evil, there's no suffering, there's no pain. He says, oh man, we're suffering right now. 
There's pain, there's evil all around us, but it's nothing compared to what's to come. Uh, I've used this illustration before, but um, Francis Chan, a pastor, says, imagine that your life is this piece of rope, this black section, and, and right here you're born, okay, and you were so cute when you were born, and then you learn to crawl, then you learn to read, then you graduate from high school, I'm skipping a few steps, uh, then maybe you travel across Europe, then maybe you get married, or you choose to stay single, you get a plant and a cat, and then you, know, you watch too much Netflix, and then you die. Right? Okay, so imagine that that is your lifetime. And you would look at God and say, God, you know, I suffered a lot in that lifetime. A lot of the Netflix I watched, I didn't like. Um, I had heartburn sometimes. Uh, bad things happened. Someone I loved died. Maybe I died of cancer. All these things, you'd say, God, there was a lot of suffering here. But Francis Chan says, what about, though, you trust in Jesus and you go to heaven? And so let's say this is your 100 years of life. And he said, but then what about all of this? And all of this is perfect, and all of this is filled with love, and all of this is joy, and all of this is perfect peace, and all of this is just greater than anything else you could ever have anticipated or imagined. I mean, it just, it's, there's just so much of it, there's a knot, but it keeps on going. <laughs> uh, Francis Chan says, in the, in the grand scheme of things, after this amount of suffering, but then you've gone through all of this just perfection, would you look at God and say, yeah, but it still isn't fair? Would you or would that begin to just disappear in the grand scheme of this eternity that just goes on and on forever? I think just like, she's not here so I can say this, Summer doesn't complain about getting that shot anymore. Dad, remember nine years ago you gave me that shot? I'm still so angry with you. No, she hasn't brought it up. I'm glad she's not here or she might remind me later today. In the grand scheme of things, there is suffering in this world. There is evil. There is the fall. There is pain. But in the grand scheme of it, God promises us so much more. And he says, all of what's to come will be absolutely perfect. It's the idea of the greater good, that there is suffering now, but there is a greater good to come, and that greater good will surpass the pain and suffering in every way imaginable. The greater good says that in the end, God's goal is the saving of many lives, and here's a question that some uh, Christian apologists uh, ask. How do we know that the level of evil and suffering in our world right now isn't the perfect amount for the saving of the most lives. We never could. We could never look at God and say, there was way too much evil. If there had been less evil, more people would have trusted in you. Well, he could equally say, if there was more evil, then maybe more people would have trusted in me. But since we believe in an all-knowing God, an all-good God, and an all-powerful God, we can trust God and say, I don't understand why. But since I know this is your goal, the saving of many lives, then, then I have to trust that the amount of evil happening is the right amount to lead to the greatest possible outcome. Christianity says that God made everything and it was perfect, but that we sin so there is pain and evil and suffering, but God is going to redeem it all. The fall, uh, creation, the fall, and redemption. God continues to look at us and say, there's something here worth saving. You guys know the John 3, 16 promise, but have you read John 3, 17 lately? Let's look at that verse together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the promise. The John 3, 16 promise, you believe in Jesus, you get eternal life. But look at what he says next. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus is God, and he looks at the world in the state of the fall of evil and all those things and still says, there's something here worth saving. I can repair this. I can fix this. I can undo this. And so Jesus, God himself, comes to us, becomes one of us in the flesh and lives among us and suffers with us through all sorts of different experiences. And then he dies for us 
to redeem us, to rescue us, to save us, to restore us, to bring us back into a right relationship with God. Jesus says, I'll do that. That that price, that consequence is worth it because of what I'm about to accomplish through it. God continues to love us and care about us. He doesn't look at you and say, man, too evil, too much suffering, too much pain. I don't value you anymore. I said, God looks and says, yes, I still love you. I still value you. And that's exactly why I lived, died, and rose again for you. I mean, if you just think about Jesus for a moment, Jesus, who is God, allows himself to suffer, to be betrayed, to have people hate him, to say, uh, tell lies about him, to beat him up, and to eventually kill him. I mean, one of the greatest things that Christianity says to the world is, Yes, there is evil. I mean, even just acknowledging that is significant. You are suffering. But something so great about Christianity is that Jesus says, I get it. I've been there. So when we shake our fists at God and say, God, why are you allowing this to happen? It hurts so much. And Jesus says, I know. I'm right there with you. God, I feel so alone right now. There's nobody with me. And Jesus says, I know. I have been there, and I'm right there with you. Jesus, I feel like God has totally abandoned me. And Jesus can say, I know. I've been there, and I'm with you, and I will carry you through this. I'll carry you through this pain. I'll carry you through this suffering. And I promise you that evil will not, cannot, does not win. Because I've already died on the cross. And I already rose from the grave. And I've prepared a place for you in heaven where it's just going to be perfect forever. If you are wrestling with the weight of sin and suffering, I want you to know that Christianity offers the best explanation for why it exists and also the only solution to it. And his name is Jesus. He created you. And he sees the effects of the fall on you. And he's redeemed you through his perfect life, death, and resurrection. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, you are a magnificent God. And your name is great in all the earth. You spoke the worlds into being and stretched out your hands and created it all by your mighty power. God, you have established your strength from everlasting to everlasting. And we see the power, the creativity of you throughout the universe. And God, we see that in the act of creation that you made us in your image and gave us the ability to know right and wrong. And we know that with that freedom, we turned away from you. And we continue to do that so often. And so, God, we ask that you'd wake us up to the reality of sin, the effects of sin, the consequence of sin and evil in our own lives. Search our hearts and point out any impure, incorrect ways or thoughts inside of us. Holy Spirit, we ask you'd tear down the walls we've built up, the excuses we've made, that you'd break the habits and the addictions we cling to that keep us from following you more closely. Father, we thank you for loving us even though we sin. We thank you that Jesus didn't come to condemn us, but he came to save the world. Help us to see ourselves as valuable. Help us to not only value ourselves, but to value the people around us in our own homes and schools and churches and communities, even the people we disagree with and the people we find hard to love. Help us to have grace and compassion for them because we know that you love them. God, we pray for those who are grieving and suffering. And we pray for those especially who grieve and suffer alone and who do not have the same hope that we have. God, we pray that they would know that they were made on purpose. We pray that they'd know that there is hope for them. No matter what situation they're stuck in, no matter how deep it seems to be or how long it's gone on, Lord, we pray that they would just know that there is an invitation from you, an invitation for a new start. 
and forgiveness and compassion and love and grace. Lord, we pray for all those people we think of, especially who struggle with addiction and who find themselves just enslaved to that. Lord, we pray that you help them to break free. We pray that you give them the strength to overcome. And even if they're not able to, we pray that they would just cling to the knowledge that they're loved and valued and forgiven in you. Lord, we pray for uh, our country, our country that has been um, divided uh, uh, along so many different issues. Lord, we pray that as Christians, we would just bring a voice of compassion and love and truth and grace. Whether we agree with people or not, that we would just be able to love them and point them to the ultimate truth, which is your son, Jesus. May he be the most important conversation we have each day. May pointing people to him be the most significant thing and the thing we're most eager to talk about every single day. Lord, we thank you that you did not come to condemn us, but you came to save us. And so we pray that we would just have that view and that perspective. Lord, we pray that you draw us to your word more so we can be filled with that and that your word and truth would season all of our conversations with grace and truth. We pray all these things in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Don't you love that even in the prayer Jesus taught us, he again says, deliver us from evil. And God, you've got the power to do it. Let's stand as we speak together the words of our Christian faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
receive a blessing from our Lord as we close our time together. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you his peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.